I'm just going to start this because we always say something funny and we always miss it. You always open by saying that now, and it ruins the fact that we were saying funny shit. <laughs> and therefore, now everybody knows that we were having a different conversation. I know, right? But it keeps them like enticed. If you just do it without even saying it, we'll keep it going. We can talk about how you're going to look like the next Dennis Rodman if you keep fucking screwing with your hair. The next color is blue. Just start making it like a soccer ball. There should just be black patches in between all the other colors. What do you think, Fee? I should change my hair or like, is it okay or what? Don't ask her. She's a girl. They change their hair all the fucking time. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm asking. Her. I actually never color my hair, so I would not know. I like my hair the way it is. I feel like natural hair is the best. <laughs> the less money you have to spend on hair, the better. That's oh, fair. somebody please tell that's my wife. See, yeah, same here. She's like, oh, I'm going to change it to blue. This, I'm going to highlight some blue right here. I'm gonna do Jess it. doesn't oh, do all no. that. Jess is just Way. like, do I get it short? Do I leave it long? Then she got it cut short, and then she was like, I don't like the way I can't put it in a regular ponytail. So, Stephen, make sure I never cut my hair again. Okay, I'll fight tooth and nail to make sure you understand that. Why do and girls now do she that? wants now she wants to cut it again. Why do and she has something cut? scheduled. I have no idea. I think it's like it's not for anyone else but themselves, and I feel like it's just like a, a way to. Oh, well, I mean, it's for other people. It's it's definitely for it's other def- people. I don't think it is, to be honest. Really? Like, if I paint my nails or if I get ready, like, it's definitely for, like, to make myself feel good. Um, yeah, but you're doing it so not that... Not so much. You, but you try to make yourself look good. We all do this. We all try to make ourselves look good so that when we go out in public, we feel like we would be noticed. Maybe not complimented, but at least noticed. Not really. At least... For really? Me, I mean, I have a boyfriend of five years, and, like, I don't get ready often, but, like, when I do, it's because I want, like... I want to make myself feel good, but it's never mm-hmm. for him. But, I don't know, but I feel like everyone's different. So. so you, so you don't feel like if you get ready and by getting ready, I mean like you're going to wear a good outfit, going to do your hair and makeup, going to, as dudes, we're going to put on like our nice watch. If we have one, uh, we're going to make sure, nice. well, you should, because you're a nice guy. So you should have a couple of watches. <laughs> um Put on like the better pair of shoes, right? You're not going to put on all your dirty shit because at some basis level, we want it maybe not to be noticed by other people. Like, we don't need other people coming up to hit on us, but just be like, okay, I look good. It looks good to me. And therefore, I'm doing it so that, you know, it looks but good. But it makes me feel good, though. Like, oh, that's yes. The, that's the thing. Like, I look like, you know, I get ready or I spend time getting ready and I put on makeup and maybe I wear something that's not training gear Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's not for someone else to notice that I look good. It's for me to my, like to feel myself and to be like, yeah, like I feel good in this. You know, that must be really nice. Cause I don't really, honestly, I put on some of the, nobody here feels bad for you. I put on some of the worst clothes ever and I just go outside and I feel I, this is the first year that I've actually bought real clothes and Tam is the reason why because I got out of the army and I was like, man, I have two pairs of pants and a one shirt. You wore nice things to my, my wedding. My entire closet is probably just training gear and then I have like a small little section of like, okay, if I'm not going to be at the gym and I need to be wearing something reasonable, like this is the small section of <laughs> But you are a real but, person, though. So, so that's the clue that you yeah. are an actual human being. The top layer of my closet, because <laughs> it's like the big horseshoe closet, and then you have your bottom rack, your top rack, and then like the shelves in between. My bottom rack is all of my uh, gym like cycle clothes. So, like all the different mm. t-shirts I have, all the different shorts, everything I wear uh, to the gym, basically, and it's just on constant cycle. And then the top rack is all of like my nice t-shirts and dress shirts and collared shirts and all that shit. And Jess always makes fun of me. She's like, you wear the same like nine, 10 shirts on cycle. You know just, why like, I time. showed up to your wedding in nice clothes? Cause Tam because it was a fucking wedding. She took me to the store and said, Hey, let's get something for you to wear, sweetheart. And I'm like, okay. So we go in the store and I dropped $250 on clothes. And I was like, this is what this is like. Well, at least I know that you can afford that. I don't feel bad. Fuck you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I mean, guys, let's get started. Cause I'm excited to chat with you and I have family here. So I want to make sure uh-oh. I get to spend time with my family. So 
Good Dang. jeez, Louise, can okay. you reschedule this? In a I fucking... didn't. That was on her. She never told me about her family, but Fee, tell and, um, everybody who you are. <laughs> <laughs> who I am, Firuse Sagafi. Most people know me by Fee. I'm a, a professional CrossFit athlete. and That is definitely not a the... white person name. I'm just no, going to point that I'm out. Definitely not. There's no part of me that is white. I Proud was born you. here in the States, and that's just about it. My mom's Mexican, <laughs> um, and my dad's Iranian, so I'm half and half. Oh, and I'm very blessed and very lucky, and I feel very fortunate to have a little have a lot of culture run through my veins here. So I speak. Uh, my first language is Spanish, but I don't speak Farsi. Me or is it, my, is it both of you guys? What was that? He froze. Anyways, you speak. You don't mm-hmm. speak Farsi. I don't. Oh, dang. I know. Was I the only one that just froze? Yeah, you were the only one that froze. Because you both froze and my whole computer kept going. I was like, oh, shit, I lost them both. Oh, my God, (laughs) Jesus. All right, go ahead, go ahead. (laughs) No, I I don't speak Farsi. Unfortunately, my father never learned it. And he could pick it up. He could pick it up in conversation, but he never actually fluently learned it enough to teach us when we were growing up. And... My grandparents didn't speak to us in Farsi, so I spoke Spanish growing up uh, because both of my parents actually speak it. My dad ended up picking it up, uh, even though he's not Mexican at all. He speaks it fluently because he uh, went to school in Mexico, and that's how he met my mom. That's how I met your mother. <laughs> where, do you, where do you go to school in Mexico? Yeah, He went to a medical school uh, in Guadalajara, Jalisco. Hmm. And it's uh, Jalisco is the state. Guadalajara is one of the bigger cities mm-hmm. in that state. And um, La Autonoma de Medicina is the uh, medical uh, medical school down in that. And city. what what kind of doctor is he? He's a neurologist. Ooh, Ooh. that's cool! Wow, yes, he is a, no an dad. absolute whiz when it comes to any le- neurological condition. Uh, the brain is something that he is just such a such a genius in researching and uh, understanding and treating. So that's pretty much what he does. So is there a way that he can help Ken out with all of his yeah, I have issues issues. with changing his hair? <laughs> I have so many hair issues, I guess. Yeah, it's not an identity crisis. He's a Derek Shepard. It's okay. <laughs> I'm just doing the one thing that I have control over because I didn't have that control in 12 years in the army. Hey, so. you have a wife, and that's all that matters. She loves you. No matter what hair color you have. Uh, well, let's, well if it's all gone. Loves you, even though you wear the same outfit every time, she's still with you. So like the world's biggest she's, okay. all- she's pregnant. She's she's stuck with me forever. <laughs> well, at least the next 18 years. She's got to deal with me in some capacity. So um congratulations, to, Steve. Uh, thank you. Um, so what does your family uh, not how, like what do they think about you being a professional athlete, but um, yeah. what's their mindset towards it? How do they see it? Do you have that perspective from them yet? Yeah, it's it's actually something that's always been in conversation. Like um, school in my family is extremely important, especially on my dad's side. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually come from a family of uh, different professionals that work in the healthcare system and from nurses to doctor, different doctors. And my grandpa was a surgeon. My dad's a neurologist. I have an uncle that's also a DO and internist. And, um, and so school has always been just, you know, the pinnacle of, of your career as, mm-hmm. <laughs> or your life, I guess. Right. And um, so anyway, so I went to John Curro University and I got my bachelor's in exercise science thinking that I was going to pursue chiropractic school because that was like on the radar for the longest time, uh, fitness and movement and just musculoskeletal system as a whole has always been a passion that I've always wanted to pursue and use and, um, help people. And that's why I coach. And that's a huge reason that I coach and I've so intensely pursued sport. It's kind of just always been a part of my life. Um, and it's been a part of my health journey in itself. Um, and then over the years, I pursued my MBA degree. I ended up getting a business degree, thinking that it would make me more competitive as a student as I like were to progress, you know, in graduate programs and applications and all that stuff. And sure enough, um, I continued and I ended up pursuing CrossFit 
uh, as, as intensely as I did. And I started to uh, get connected with some incredible brands and people in the sport and ended up um, starting to work with an agent. And he got me connected to so many opportunities that at that point I was like, there's only a small window of time that you get to mm -hmm. pursue sports in your life, especially at this level. And it's been such a big part of my life in general. And so that's when I was just like, you know what, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to give it hell and give it my all. And mm -hmm. um, school will always be there when it needs to be. But I think I've opened a lot of doors for myself to, mm -hmm. to keep doing what I love. So that's first, kind of the first question. The, who is your agent? Yeah. Cooper Marsh. Okay, okay cool. So we did from lab management. Ken, whew. thank God. Yeah. I was like, oh no. Oh, God. Oh, you haven't been no, no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. We're not gonna we're not gonna cover yeah, we're that. We're not gonna cover that one. It's okay. not mm -mm. uh so <laughs> what made you push all your chips, or maybe not even all your chips, but what made you really be like, hey, we're gonna go for this, like we're gonna go hell for leather? Yeah, I think I think what truly did it was I finally like ever, I mean, growing up, I've always loved playing sports, doing sports, doing it uh, intensely. I think I always wanted to be outside but, um, and in teams and traveling, but I never got my chance to like actually have a moment in my life where I was doing something that I loved because when I was little growing up, um, I've always been pushed to do things that was more for my parents, like violin and music. And that was a huge part of my life actually for 14 yeah. years. Um, and I finally kind of stumbled onto CrossFit as a lifestyle change, as something that just kept me healthy and good and mentally in a good place. Um, and then as I like kind of picked it up doing the open and qualifying and I was like, man, like I could, I could really do something and I could really use this to share who I am and my story, but also like finally do something that's like for me mm -hmm. and I could do it in a way that, you know, maybe other people can relate to and it's cool coming from a place that maybe you don't have it all to start but it was you know you work hard and you yeah. get uh committed to just investing in in hard work not so much talent yeah. um along the way and you can make it and you could do great things and you don't have to have it all when you first start so that was just kind of the start of that journey. And I finally was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And not because it's going to, you know, make me millions of dollars because it's no, we're clearly seeing that and you're days. not making, you know, <laughs> a ton of money, especially if you're pursuing it intensely. If anything, it's, it's a huge investment, but mm -hmm. um, it's kind of one of those crazy things where you feel really proud of yourself and uh, for kind of just pursuing what you love. And along the way, I've been able to connect with great people pursue opportunities that I could never do in the classroom so it's it's been it's been something that I never saw myself doing if you were to ask yep. me like just a couple of years ago is this at 27 is this where you could see your life absolutely not well hey we're the same age mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, 27 let, let me ask you it's um, a great age. do you think and I guess this can go to both of you guys and by no means do I want to diminish anybody's accomplishments yours or anybody else is in the space. I, I recently thought about this uh, and it tripped me up for a little bit. Do you think it is easier or harder for women to enter the CrossFit space and be successful, even moderately? I feel like there's a lot compared of men to compared to men. Compared to men. Is it easier or harder? That's like, a wild question. It is a wild question because I saw like there's there's always like a semi larger leaderboard for men. I, I don't know if it's just dudes get into CrossFit more often or if they're just that much more competitive. Um, I definitely feel like uh, uh, not that women have like a lower standard or a lower bar to reach, but there aren't as many women, I think, that are trying to attain like what you're trying to attain. There's plenty of women that can get into the sport, do it moderately, and then kind of be like, cool, I'm, I'm good with this. This is not. I don't have that competitive drive. Then there's dudes where just like pure testosterone just is like, I got to have a pissing contest with these other men. So I'm going to do everything I can, <laughs> even if it breaks me to get to that point. So, so that's why, that's why I wonder. And I just wanted to ask you both, 
Yeah. Because it was sitting in my mind. I didn't know if women felt like they have a very hard road or if it's kind of like, well, I think it's, I think it is just as hard. Okay. It is just as hard because, well, first of all, you're only competing against, you know, your, your women, but um, Mm -hmm. it's crazy to hear. Like, I mean, I don't know about you, but the fact that 16 year olds, 17 year olds, 18 year olds, like some of my competitors are 10 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's more than just one girl now. Right. Like it is like, you have Emma Lawson, you have Olivia Kersetter, you have um, Olivia Sulik, you have Mallory O'Brien, obviously completely like coming up and dominating and not just tapping into it, but completely like just flooring the competition. Um, and I mean, the guys have it, but I feel like most of the chat lately has been about the women, to be honest. And that, um, that's more that's why I asked my, that unbiased, question. My biased opinion. Um, and it's I said it that hard. way because I think like the 20 year olds to like the 28 year olds aren't necessarily, I don't want to say they're not the most competitive, but they're, they're very in between on this, on the spectrum of like, they're either kind of good or they're really, really good. But then there are those teenagers that are like, yeah, what the fuck? Oh, we're just going to, we're going to leapfrog all of you. Yeah. And we're going to make it up to like four spaces behind the Tia mm-hmm. and the like veterans. And it's going to leave all those like middle-aged, and I say middle-aged, higher 20s maybe that are just like, what the fuck is she? I'd, I'd be curious though too. I'd be curious to see the field, the professional field and the ages right now, mm-hmm. men compared to women. And also considering yes. the professional women in the sport that have become mothers and are yes. still the best. You know, right? And it, it's not the same as, men becoming fathers because having no, 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 a no. child yeah. doesn't destroy your body the way that it does to well, women's body. Well, you know, my wife naps a lot and now all of a sudden it makes me want to nap a lot. <laughs> physiologically. That doesn't destroy, that doesn't physiologically destroy my what body. Happens, <laughs> I mean, Annie Thorsatter, Kara Saunders, um, oh my God, it's, uh, Mackenzie Riley. Um, not only have they become mothers, but they've been able to balance businesses, obviously their professional mm-hmm. careers, a family, and they're still the best in the sport. Yes. So I'd be curious. And because is Cara of that, still, because is cars, I, I don't mean to know, is cars still competing? Do we know? Oh, yeah. Yes, I, she, from oh, okay. what I know, yes. Yeah. And I, I thought she was I just hanging out. Leaderboard, and from what I've seen, she is crushing it. I mean, she's, I, I hope I, you know, I hope, I hope I get to compete against her again. And she's just incredible. And she's, and so because of that, I say it is harder at least for women um, to tap into that space and to get to that level, because there's so many amazing women that are getting older, but they're not going away. They're becoming Mm -hmm. mothers and they're not leaving the field. Um, Sam Briggs, she's still competing. Like, isn't that crazy? And Sam Briggs is a fucking human anomaly. She's incredible. And she is. She's also a firefighter, isn't she? So like her job. Yeah. She's a firefighter, I believe in the UK. And she is. She lives in Ohio her, now. Does she? Yeah, no, she I thought in, she was in the um, UK. No, I think she's. She, I don't know. If she's in Toledo or Cincinnati or. I could see her being close to Rogue. She's somewhere I, in Ohio. She's a now. she's a big, uh, long time Rogue athlete. I wouldn't doubt them have yeah. given her like some job and been like, "Hey, we'll we'll help put you up here." But I remember she was uh, when she was living in the UK. There was one of those Road to the Games episodes, and she was a. Uh, Jesus. Going to her day job as a firefighter. Bro, and I was like, plays, well, oh, okay. She, she plays six in the UK this year. She's 40 years old. Dude, it's, she, her, like, the better part of, like, the last guys, 20 years has been her guys doing that. have that on the field? Also, from uh, a scientific perspective. Maybe a handful. Like, like, I can give you the numbers in the scientific portion. Like, from science, like, testosterone beats down your joints in your body. Like, it does. Mm, like, testosterone true. creates a higher level of cortisol in your body, which eats away at your cartilage in your knees and ankles and any joint basically yeah. you guys have far less testosterone not diminishing what women have been able to do you guys are amazing i watched emma lawson power clean 220 pounds the other day and i was like oh what the fuck oh like, yeah that's amazing yep. <laughs> but like but physiologically they are just literally built to last longer yeah, you guys are built to it's last not just longer. because men are slightly dumb and we do <laughs> dumb shit that is part of it i think i think women have a higher pain tolerance and i oh, think yeah. that's why For we sure. a lot of longer um yeah so to go back to your question that's like a very very long 
answer to. Very I, good answer. Harder, I think it's harder to compete in. Do, you, the only reason why I kind of think differently is like how you said um, the teenagers are coming in and they're just like swiftly taking people's positions. As I say that in the sense that men, there's no way on God's green earth that anyone in the teenage division, 16 to 20, could go and stand next to, let me see, uh, Jared Stevens. There's uh, no way that a 16 Jacob Hepner is going to outlift. Uh, Justin Medeiros, I think 22 years old, did it. So Yeah, but he did it. Uh... He did it at a time where it was like, Everybody that went to that game, as much as I will never take anything away from him, he destroyed that year. But there was not, other than like the, what was it, the snatch ladder? Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that was literally the only power output movement that I think they really did. All the rest of them were like just dudes cleaning or power cleaning like 225 or slightly above. And that's like, not. I don't want to diminish it. It was just, I think he won at the right time. He was very good. Yeah. But he didn't have to do like no climb back, no like wide diversity of movements like the last few years. He didn't have to pull did he win Rogue? Builder. But he won Rogue. He, he did won win Rogue. Rogue. He yes. Uh, <laughs> but all the power I output know, movements, he, he did sure not. I was at that uh, that Rogue Invitational. He podium, he podiumed at the MAC. Yeah. Won the CrossFit Games. Yep. Yeah, also did. won Rogue. Um, mm-hmm. And he's only 22. So he came I think third he's. The Mac. Now, yeah, I will say I this, a young 20 something year old, like once you start, impossible. once you hit that 20 year old range, what your body can do is amazing. But when you're in your teens as a male, there's nobody standing next to these uh, 29 to 32 year olds and even yeah. comparing because yeah, even like yeah. a Sam Dancer, who's like, it's just I don't want to call him one sided. Yes, they do. And yeah. they men take a little also... bit longer to truly develop like in their bodies and strength mm-hmm. and as a man, I think. And then um, women and obviously women, are think, just like... smarter. <laughs> it's called what it is, uh, folks. It took me it took me like I think I picked up a barbell three years ago for the first time ever. And I was like super. That's not the thousandth time this podcast has heard but, that. I mean, but it's like in all honesty, when I was a teenager, I never lift weights, but there's not gonna no. be a sixteen or seventeen year old that's gonna outlift me right now that's not gonna happen i'm not like i'm mm-hmm. not gonna let that happen <laughs> there, there, i mean there is that the one there's the that only... one teenage boy that lifts uh like a brick shit house right now and i forget what the he has a mullet and is not i not to be rude to him he's not the greatest looking dude in the world but <laughs> he has a distinct mullet but boy like front squats like 435 power cleans like a oh 295 and it's like oh hmm, that's a that's a 16, 17 year old boy. That's still not enough. <laughs> Ken, I'm sorry, but like, that kid's uh, coming for you. He's and he's short, so he doesn't have to move it that far. <laughs> That's no, wild. I, I think that, you know, based on the numbers, there are more men that enroll in the open than there are women. I think this is the first year that it came really, really close. I think it was a hundred and mm-hmm. um hundred and twenty thousand women compared to two hundred and twenty-three thousand men. Yeah, that's right. Two hundred twenty-three thousand men, and that by by based on the law of averages, it's a little harder for men to beat out that competition. And also, it depends on your age. So, if you're a thirty-five to thirty-nine year old male in that division, it's a little bit easier. What was the RX divisions? Were the RX divisions still more men more men than women? Because I feel like there could be some discrepancies because with so many different divisions of like scaled Mm -hmm. and. RX and foundations and um, that always changes things up. I'd be curious to see. So you know what's funny though? Fighting. So <laughs> I coach at CrossFit Mentality here in uh, Metro Ohio. And um, I don't know if you're familiar, but uh, Scott Pantrick, he's the affiliate owner of CrossFit Mentality. Ooh. And I joined, good dude, amazing. He's like big brother to me. And I'm so excited for him again once again this year but um the reason that I bring it up is because when he first opened his gym the majority of the members were men um Mm -hmm. compared to women and now throughout the years we actually the majority of the members are females compared to males and you take one look at class and the women are just dominating uh membership it's it's the best I love it like it's something that for me it's empowering but I think at first 
CrossFit used to be this thing where women were intimidated to do it yes. or I'm um, so, scared to do it next to men um, or didn't feel as capable. For the women, there was one, 115,194. So I was pretty close to the other stat. Okay. This one. And then for RX <laughs> men, <laughs> RX men, there were 144,036. Damn. Okay. We have 30,000 more people in our division, but that's not taken away from what women were able to accomplish. Yeah. But No, because let's be honest, how many of those men probably just paid their 20 bucks just to say they're in it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people that didn't even submit scores, but it, yeah. Yeah. but it like, when you look at it from the standpoint of like, oh, you know, a dude has to, it, it, right now, a 315 pound power clean is not even an entry. 70th, an entry. 70th yeah. percentile. That's like 70th percentile. You got to be power clean like 350, 340 to like be super competitive. Whereas, you know, you guys mature faster. It's not fair. I can't not- get enough weight fast enough. <laughs> you need <laughs> weight to move weight, and I don't want I don't a dad bod, Ken. I'm still developing in my strength as that's just been the hardest thing for me, just because it's just some people develop it easier than others. And it's kind of one of those things that I just need to be patient with. And I've been working really mm-hmm. hard on, but I will say I do not have a 225 power clean, um, but not yet, it's not crazy. yet. It's like, and then eventually, yes, not yet. And it's definitely getting there, but it's not the, I used to think it's like not the most important thing, no. but it is the thing that could get you far enough down on a leaderboard and competition where the only way to make up that placing is to be like consistently in the top five. And that's exactly kind of what happened to me last year. And for the longest time, I didn't think uh, at the Mac, I didn't think that like strength should be a priority. And then as as sure enough, um, I took a large hit and it was just something that like, unless you're placing like top three, you can't come back from a low 20th you know, place finish or 25th place finish, whatever that ended up being. So it does come down to it. It's like, you don't have to be a heavy lifter, but you also can't be at the end of the pack. Like the goal should always kind of be in the middle there. If anything. That's why I feel like uh, Haley Adams is going through a lot of, she's one of those females that's atop the leaderboard most often or right close to it. And then as soon as there's a weightlifting movement, anything over, anything over her 85%, so you just slowly start trickling down, which, yeah. hey, it. I don't want to say there's no excuse, but in that training environment, there's almost no excuse. I will say in your training environment, we're probably going to poke at you if you are connected with Scott. I would love to have him on here, uh, but we'll save that for another time. Uh, so now that you mentioned that, what is it like training with, uh, is Scott the sole owner? Or does like all the brothers kind of have a deal there? No, actually that there's been a uh, change in that for some time now. So Scott's actually complete owner. I was Scott Panchuk and his wife, Kristen, okay. um, and they own the affiliate. Um, his brothers never owned the affiliate. Um, they've mm-hmm. always kind of been under him as when they first started there as coaches and Scott helped them grow as athletes and coaches. And, um, you know, they're his little brothers. And at, yeah. sure enough, um, there was a point in their life where they were like, you know what, we're ready to take on, you know, our own careers. And that's when they had opened up their affiliate uh, at the time, CrossFit Cliffside. And I believe they opened it for a little bit. Um, and there's been a lot of shift in their professional careers as well yeah, so then that, that closed down and then Saxon I believe is in Nashville Spencer's here in Ohio um still but they don't they don't uh they're not part of uh the ownership of CrossFit oh, okay. I was just saying just mm-hmm. in the sense of like what is it like to train around uh like a family like that or like yeah. just an atmosphere yeah. more or less the environment. I've always mostly trained around Scott Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't like really trained around his brothers all that, uh, just because while they were at the gym, I never like, I guess I was never there yet. Right. I was always a member. I was always a member and I would always take classes and I would always be there working hard. And, um, but up until 2018, 2019, that's when I started to train with Scott training around him. And what is it like? I will say it is the hardest thing, not in the sense of, you know, um, not fun, but it is truly from morning to night to afternoon to evening you are just working so hard and training with him scott is a workhorse 
probably one of the hardest workers I've ever witnessed. And he is just, he has this mindset of like, he's not doing enough. Like he always has this thing in his oh, head okay. where it's like, I could always do more. I should do one more thing or he'll end the day thinking like, what more could I've done? Um, and he's just obsessed with just truly, truly working hard and outworking, you know, his competitors. He's to going back to those, he, those days where he would compete against Rich. He yeah. would buy like yeah, one rep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One rep and he's like, and what I, I, fuck? And, yeah, and I mean, when he partnered with Mayhem, um, uh-huh. he had a, uh, you know, a short season with them until COVID changed things. And then he went mm-hmm. back as an individual and that whole thing. But so I had been training with him for that period of time. And it is just, if you cannot, train the way that he trains or mayhem or any of that if you don't want to work hard because the work Mm -hmm. is just gritty and it's a grind and you you'd be exposed very quickly and people burn out very quick too um but i've grown a lot as an athlete and i've grown a lot mentally um it's the relationship we have is more than just you know this athlete relationship or training partner relationship we've gotten to know each other um about you know he knows who i am as a person more than just an athlete right here. so it's cool to be able to have that relationship with someone that you see as almost like your family now or a big brother or a mentor and even though i'm with brute strength now so matt torres is actually my coach oh good i was about strength. to ask us yeah yeah he's he's scott still in my corner and he's he mentors me and checks in and you know gears me and you know in the right direction if i have questions or just mentally is just the guy that i always i'll always trust you know with everything even like during events like we went to wadapalooza and you know he would always just like know what to say to get me so fired up and it's just like to have that is amazing (laughs) that's amazing i have a question for you so what at what point did you realize like or i i guess i'm having this problem like it's kind of like an opinion thing how did you like have that turnover between okay i'm doing this it's fun and you're like oh shit i'm good at this i can be Mm. really good at this like what was that moment when was that well hopefully she didn't stop thinking that oh hey this is fun (laughs) no it's i guess i I like never it's not like a thing you wake up to and you're just like like click of a button you know it's switch or something that kind of just develops and i wouldn't be doing it now if i didn't find it fun Mm. because it is, it is my job now, right? Like I do, like, this is what pays the bills and puts food on the table and pays my debts. And like, this is my job, like truly. Um, so I go, my, my job has me going to the gym from sometimes 8am, 8, eight, you know, 8.30 to walking out 7pm at night. Um, oh, but there's, a, there was days. this moment of like, uh, I continue to set very small goals for myself throughout, you know, my I guess, as I started to like have this thing in my head where I do want to get competitive. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, through that process, it was still knowing like why I'm doing this. And I obviously wasn't doing it for a paycheck because I was making no money. Like (laughs) when you're training for your first regionals, you're not making any money. You're not sponsored. You're not working for brands. When you get to regionals and your first regionals like me goes the way that it did. And I think I got like a low 30th something finish. Mm -hmm. You're not doing it for money like you're just doing it because like that's what you're you love and if you were to do it to just instantly be successful you you, most people would quit so so immediately um but I think I just fell in love with the process and the journey of like the connection I was making the people the relationships I was building along the way um having like a season or a rookie year and finishing um, whether or not it went in my the way that I wanted to go or not, I obviously got cut at the games in 2019. But the thing that you think about the most is like everyone that helped you get there and everyone that was a part of it and the training and the bad days and the good days and, you know, the people that believe in you. And that's what's fun. Like, that's what's so rewarding. Um, and that's also kind of the thing that gets you so fired up to do it again and to pull people along with you again. Um, but also not to do it for yourself, but also use what you love and maybe to pour it into other people. And then you see other people shine and other people pursue what they love. Sure. And it's really, it's a really cool process. And I think that's what's like kept it fun, yeah. not just the training because at this point, training is very much lonely sometimes. Um, I'm in the gym by myself a lot more than ever because uh, Scott and I train differently and 
different times and maybe he's in and we're training different pieces, which is great and still working hard next to each other, but we don't do that every day anymore. Um, so yeah, so it's not just like, oh yeah, training's fun because training is hard as shit. Yeah. It is so hard. And to do that every single day, practically for the majority of the year is, is very, it's, it could be a struggle sometimes. Were you, so do you, <laughs> the 2019 games, were you a fan of those cuts or the way that they did it? Or do you think they could have did it differently, I guess, in a way? Yeah, I was, I mean, to, to work so hard for uh, that, you know, the pinnacle of your year, I think cuts are, I think they're awful. I think it's, you know, you, you invest so much to get there and to be cut. Um, I think the field shouldn't have been as big as it was. Yeah. I don't huge. think, I don't think if, if you truly wow. want the best, if you truly want the best in the world to be representing your sport, you shouldn't have people that, you know, aren't representing that. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think that's where, uh, you know, there was, I didn't necessarily agree with it. I don't think the field should be that big. I don't, I don't think, think that Bo Share deserved a fucking spot. Yeah. I don't think <laughs> that, nerd. like, you, when you do something like that, you're trying to test across these domains what the, who the fittest person is. You yeah. can't cut someone after a rope climb run snatch event. Like, you can't. Yeah. You can't, that's not well, how you should. Yeah. Do that. Well, well, so like, the community had asked for, more countries more individuals to be included that represented the sport represented their nation and i got it like national champions if you are the fittest person in your country and there's a registered gym even if there's just one gym the sport is represented the community is represented so the fittest person even if you're bangladesh or something and you have one gym and you are the best person in that gym, no offense, but by the rules and by what everybody wanted, yeah. that person should go. So I agree to an extent here, but I think it's because the games was not big enough to say that yet, but they wanted to give the fans and the people in the community what they asked for, which was more diversity, more inclusion, more countries represented. Mm -hmm. And then they were like, Oh fuck! This isn't quite this. big enough to hold. <laughs> like, what was it? Two hundred and eighty athletes. Yeah, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. I saw you. You guys walk out, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. But then so the many. the decent part was that workout of running, rope climbs, and snatches was classic CrossFit. Yeah. It was. It wasn't yeah. some like, "Hey, this is all like we're just gonna do like a load bearing event, yeah. and we're just gonna see who's what." But like, a Brent Vakowski should not fucking have a problem with that yeah, no. a brooke wells should not have a, an issue with that so the people who are generically still the fittest who would have already made it to that level of competition regardless of these extra like 100 people hey just go out there and burn them out but if that one out of 100 takes your spot because they had more heart than you well part it's of this game mental. and part of this sport is yeah. being prepared at all times and yes like you said mental like if you don't have the killer instinct to take this seriously from the first event to the last, and you're like, well, 13, 14 events, I can maybe, you know, take one off if I'm real tired. Like, no, mm -mm, sorry. Yeah, Old boy ahead. from Afghanistan that's actually here <laughs> is going to kick your ass, and then you're going to go home while he goes on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just think that yeah, whole that was sprint pretty thing wild. Is weird. It was wild yeah, though. It was, it was absolutely nuts. Yeah. There's just so much that could happen. That's that after an event like that, no way. Yeah. Have a but, cut after you know a 20 second event or what did you like? Did you enjoy it as it got down to like the round of 10 and so? That to me did was I, that was gold. They had something there where they just started cutting the field down to like 10 and to five people. So that you yeah, yeah, that but there's still so much that could happen. Like even there is true. Even I mean, even on a final day of a competition where you have two more events to go, you could be in the top 10 and tank an event and you're quickly out of that top 10. Yeah. Um, That's true. And all it takes is one event or more people to get in between others. And that's where it's like top 10 is like such a small field of play that at that point. So maybe you can answer this for me, because the reason why I think it's better if you 
kept cutting it down. I got more invested in it because it's like March Madness style, right? <laughs> Granted, those are big games, whatever, like long amounts of time to make things happen. But when you started seeing like Brookwell step on the line, right? She's cut. Mm-hmm. Then you have like the next event. Somebody has a hamstring pull. He's down. It's really only down to nine people now. And you keep going that way. I was like, at the end, I was like, it do- it doesn't really matter. Or at least as a fan, I saw it this way because most of those people that don't get top three are not relying on the games paycheck they receive. Oh. They all year round, like all of them that got knocked out seem to bitch and moan. I don't know about your case. I didn't follow you at the time, but uh, I felt like a lot of people bitch and moan. They're like, I worked so hard for this all year long. And like, this was like how I'm going to make my money. And it was like, no offense, Brooke. We all fucking know this is not how you make, make your, your money. money. You You're know. making 30, maybe 40 K on this appearance here based on your placement, unless you make podium. And then obviously you start getting your bigger pay raises. Um, so like the I would say the normal like twenty through five range of ranking like you make your average like low income housing paycheck but then the rest of the year you're getting your five six seven uh, sponsorship deals I just thought that tearing it down that way just made it more competitive because you had to be good at all the right things at all the right times yeah but if you yeah. reshuffle them it would have a different top ten. Yeah. And I mean, if you were to have different events, then it was just, I don't know. I think there's just so much that could still happen. And like, also at that point, if you made it that far, you should be able to finish. Yeah. It's like everything that you've tested up until that point Mm -hmm. qualifies you to be at the games. Right. So it's like, and if it comes down to like the top 20 and like you're getting cut already, then it's like, there's so much there's so much that could still happen that you don't get a chance to be a part of. There's so much that isn't locked in that could still, you know, whether someone again, like someone, you know, has one bad event or tank something and they're in the top five and sure enough, shoots them down to top 10. And that's a whole different paycheck. If you want to talk paycheck. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, So it's just, I don't know. I think at that point, I think there shouldn't be just a top 10 by the last day because still so much, so much happens and you really never know. I mean, I think at some point you do have a sense of like, okay, top three are definitely going to be X, Y, Z, but even then sometimes it just comes down to a couple points. So yeah. When it yeah, comes I, to being upset by the paycheck, I don't think, I mean, I mean, obviously money is, is some, is a huge thing in the sport and it's, it's the backbone to grow. The, it's the people developing. doing it. Yeah. But, um, but I think no one's getting upset, getting cut because of their pay. Everyone's getting upset. If you get cut, you want to fucking compete and yeah. excuse yeah. my language, but like people no, get good. like really fired up. And if you're out of your competition, the competition that you worked so hard for and you're out, you're not complaining because you get less pay you're complaining because you've worked so hard for this dang weekend that you can't be in it anymore and you invest so much already so but that's every sport though that's that's like michael jordan when he said um i didn't lose i just ran out of time right or they didn't give me more time but at Mm -hmm. some point i think crossfit will do something that like baseball has done over the last like 10 or 15 years where they have to add review they have to add this or they have to change that or they have to be like oh hey we're not going to have these shifts anymore because it brings batting averages down and such i I think think crossfit will continue to maneuver in and out of these these lanes of competition because it is the unknown and the unknowable that makes the sport fun but i think that they should the first step that they should take is revising how they do scoring Yes, like, that should be a bit. It should not. It should not very be. Much oh, if you're first, you get a hundred. Second, you get ninety five. I think it should be based on the total results of the entire event. What was the one hundred percentile? Okay, who hit the next hundred percentile? Next ninety percentile, and it keeps doing just like they do the leaderboard for the open. It would be a more equal, like representation of your relative strength or fitness in that one event or time domain. So, like you do, you do Fran, and the top time is a. I know it's crazy, but a minute 12, bam. Fee comes in at a minute 20. Okay, cool. But then you have someone that comes in at a minute 21. Technically, if if, if you wait it out, that person would be third, you'd be second, the other person would be first. And yeah. if you waited across the entire field of averages, would be a lot better scoring system. 
I can see that. Yeah. So, I mean, no matter what, I think the sport is still so new. And what's mm-hmm. great about this past year is now there's there's more of a stand on, you know, having athletes that have been in it for some time representing in these boards, the PFA, the Athletes Association, um, working together with CrossFit to communicate, you know, these issues and to like truly, you know, be a resource of clarity for yeah. people that do ha- want those answers where before, to be quite honest, I don't know who was making all these decisions. No one really does. No. Was it a board of members that we don't know about? Was it two people? Was this just chit chat in between that they're just like, yeah, you think this is good? Yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But at least this year, you know, I think CrossFit is definitely trending in the right direction. Um, but at the same time, like, it's not the NFL. It's not the MLB. It's not the NHL, like where these sports have just been around for decades and decades and decades. And even then, like these sports, their sports are still, I mean, there's always like new rules coming out or that they go about the league. And, and I think people need to remember that this CrossFit is, it's barely in its like first true decade. It didn't. uh, Yeah. And it's just the reality of it is it's still developing, but the more, conversations we could have right the more uh athletes that represent the voices of the people that are involved in the sport i think it's only going to trend in the right and it's already been making some great changes too um so the cuts are different the payouts are now different now there was a lot of lot of conversation on like if you make it to the games like i should not you know have placed as as like whatever i placed in 2019 and got zero out of it um you know just the participation uh, pat on the back pretty much is what you get out of that. But now there's payouts up until I think every, every place yeah. gets something. Because and that's a step they, in the right direction. Cause they use your name and likeness for stuff. And you're like, if you're using yes. my name and likeness, please pay me. If it's a thousand dollars, you put me on a fucking poster, pay me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's and pay me for shirt. every fucking poster you put me on. Yeah. And that's something that, you know, or he's giving me those posters so I can sign them and then sell them. Have somebody else pay for them. <laughs> but CrossFit has, has been very much, um, you know, heading in the right direction in the sense of they're now very open to ideas and restructuring and just hearing people and which makes me really happy and really happy to like where it's going where before I feel like we didn't have as much open conversation about certain things. Yeah, I think is so long as the company itself does not refuse change, they'll go in the right direction. But that definitely doesn't mean like, hey, every time somebody has uh, the good idea theory to come waving her fucking wand, that does not mean you just fucking do whatever she says. <laughs> make sure we think about it for a little bit. And make a decision. But one of the other things they should do is start to run this shit through the affiliates is be like, hey, you guys wanted say you guys wanted to have more out of the three grand that you give us every year. How about whenever we start coming up with these? topics of change whether it's at the games level or whether it's at the affiliate level um let's send out like an email blast hey if you guys all vote on this this is what we'll go down and do but change is coming so Mm -hmm. again the unknowing and the unknowable the ever-changing landscape this competition can be something that is like literally a hundred times bigger than it is now they should move the games almost bi-yearly, I think. I think they should continuously be changing the rules, not the standards, but the rules of like how the competition is going to go. And then I think if you can continuously do that, you evade all of these other, uh, what is it, like the tactical games and the mountain something games or the uh, all the ones that are like trying to do like the Iron Man version of this or the, uh, the Spartan versions of this. Oh, High Rocks. Yeah, all of those will stay in the rearview mirror if you continuously make this not progressive in the sense of like including more people, but hey, every every year the rules or like the uh, how this is going to be run is going to be a little different. Sometimes there's going to be cut. Sometimes we're going to do it this way. Sometimes we're going to go down to Ken's rule, right? You have to be good at all times and all facets in between the ears, under a barbell, on a set of rings, on your hands. You can't ever sit here and be like, well, I thought I'd work my ass off more than everybody else here, and I'm in the first set of cuts. Yeah. Well, what did you do wrong? Well, you stepped on a line. Sorry, that's the, the standard of this year. So, 
That's an interesting opinion. I so hope they you? don't. I hope they don't change rules every year. As a competitor in the sport, yeah, that would hard. be very stressful. Maybe not. Maybe not every year, but something of the sort. Where... I'm not going to knock it, but that's an interesting opinion, Stephen. I, I hope they don't. I mean, I don't know. Year. I don't know how else. You, I don't think that you can standardize this into a box and be like, we're going to consistently deliver this to the viewership and to the sport and the. The fans, the people in you should keep local. updating the rule. You should update the rule book as you see things as you grow. You should just well, yeah. Like a progr- but I'm saying, oh, I think what you I think that is, communication should happen yeah. well before the season starts. Yes. I will say. That. Okay, so that would I be. I think that communication huge, shouldn't be happening yeah. as the season has already initiated and you're no. through your qualifications and you're getting ready for the next stage and all of a sudden there's like a new rule or a new standard or a standard that hasn't been clarified. And you're in the middle of a quarterfinals workout and you're like, mm-hmm. what can I or can I do? I think the clarity there needs to be better. And um, I think that goes back to Ken saying like the so. judging, the judging needs to become a more professionalized yeah. version of itself. And that's how I, that's how I envisioned what I just said was like, you have consistent judging. The standard is the same across the board. It's applied even with penalties. Like if a judge fucks up a call and they like screw your placement, there should be some type of a review system, I believe, where you can be like, hey, I'm going to wave my challenge flag and be like, that official didn't understand the rule and they fucked me over. Can we go back? Can we watch that and have a correction? And also like a rating system for the judges. Like if you yeah. have so many errors in your judging as a compared to your video, that judge needs to be like, not banned, but like put on probation or sent for remedial judge. training. Yeah, remedial training. Here you go. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go do this shit again. You know, you're gonna take the level because mm-hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to take really people's money ideas. away from them. But I think you should. You should. Uh, I'm definitely open to uh, sending that through to PFA and getting yeah. that acknowledged. Like, and, it's like your like Uber said, rating. Like, this is uh, th- these are all great conversations to have, and I think having them is the best thing that you could do, but also not just having them, but actually like communicating them Mm -hmm. to your, you know, board members. And as I don't know if you guys know, but like, you know, the board members uh, that initiated the PFA actually are, you know, Brent Fikowski, Pat Vellner. I'm definitely on there. And there's some representation. Um, I know uh, uh, the Duchik brothers are on there. Um, And there's representation actually from different continents of athletes. And these are athletes that are in the sport and are invested just as much as you guys, right? Uh, mm-hmm. I'm truly invested in change and good change. So these are all great ideas that um, definitely we're going to keep having those conversations and hopefully it, it'll never be perfect. That's the thing that people need to understand. Like, yes, it'll net whatever they decide by next year. Hopefully it's better and it will be better, but it will never be the thing that makes everyone just like, yes, this is the perfect thing. Um, but we continue on. And if uh, right now my focus in the season is to compete, and to do what I can and to just absolutely, hopefully, you know, I, I'm competing at the Granite Games in the next couple of weeks. And my only focus is to get that top five and get back to the games. <laughs> yeah, that is a stacked field. You got you got your work cut out for you. I yeah. think you got it. I think you can do it. I really do. I, I truly believe I can. And <laughs> I think all the girls have their work cut out for them, not just me. But we, so we, before we get yeah. before we let you go, That's I do want to ask you <laughs> one last question. Uh, it Taylor is more to like what the podcast is for. Um, what is something we obviously can understand what your goals are going through the rest of the season. What is a goal you have outside of CrossFit yeah. that you want to try to achieve the rest of this year? Oh, this year. Yeah, we'll keep it simple. Real simple. Not five years, just one year. <laughs> what do I want to achieve at the end of the season? Just or you can just be throughout the entire season, just yeah. like something you want to do that's outside of the realm of CrossFit. competing. Just nothing to do with CrossFit. Zero. You want to in, learn how to invest. You want to read X books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Um, I actually so one of the biggest things that I've been like truly involved or passionate about is nutrition, and it's something that I I've always loved and mm-hmm. investing and in, investing some more time in that because one of one of my goals. Um, whether it's by the end of this or after the end of the season or starting next year as I definitely want to start being more involved in people's journeys and their lives and how to guide them in a way, not just fitness and performance, but also nutrition and how to do that in a way that's manageable and to start in my community because our community is so incredible and it's small, but we're, we're, 
we're very close. And one of the things that is a struggle for a lot of people is understanding like true wellness when it comes to their life outside of the gym. Um, and it all starts with how you, you know, the stressors in your life, your nutrition and all those things. And it's such a big part of what I've been learning to do for myself. I would mm -hmm. love to be a part of, you know, the team of coaches that could pour into others in that way. Um, and it's just a true passion. And it's something that I would love to pursue. And uh, I actually work with Mike Molloy from M2 Performance. Mm -hmm. um, he is an absolutely like incredible nutrition coach and mentor and he just guides me in the best ways. And he always tries to make it to our semifinals too, which he is, I think, this coming. And I've learned so much just on my own, like through him and him guiding me that to pour that back into someone else is incredibly rewarding. So. Well, let us say thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great time with your family. Do a whole bunch of fun stuff today. Um, Ken and I, for all the listeners, we will keep all of the, uh, the stuff down. I'm not going to go through all the sponsors. No, no, that just I don't send everybody where they can find her. Uh, <laughs> yes. So go on Instagram. Uh, Fee is there. Fee, you can tell everybody if there's somewhere else that they can find you, any businesses, anything they can help support. Mainly there. Um, CrossFit Mentality is where I coach. Um, mm -hmm. If you go on their Instagram, you'll see uh, a whole lot of good, good stuff on our community. Um, Actually, we're having a rally at mentality competition. Those of you who are looking to go to Cleveland for a nice uh, upcoming competition here in the next couple of months. So check that out. But pretty much my life, my home, my community, my family all revolves around CrossFit mentality. And, and uh, if anyone's ever in the area, come on by. All right, guys. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, Fee, thank you for joining us. Anybody who needs to know anything about our sponsors or where we're brought to you guys by, head over to our Instagram account and hit the link tree, and then all the information is there. Uh, don't be stingy. Go out and buy some stuff. Use our codes. Help us out. Uh, <laughs> Fee, thank you so much for joining us. Ken, thank I will talk guys. to you in a little bit, buddy. Uh, we're going to go have ourselves a good Sunday. Yep. Enjoy. All right, Bye see you later, guys. Fee. Bye. Yes.